So we've been in Daniel chapter 7, and we're looking at basically the time of the Ancient of Days coming and the time when judgment is given to the saints. So keep a finger there, because we're going to come right back there, um, or a marker or whatever you've got to throw into that place. And uh, we just want to go to Revelation chapter 4 and plug it into where we've been um, reading, and that's Revelation chapter 4. And we've been looking at the 24 elders, which come up in verse 4, and the throne, of course, in verse 3. So the last few chapters, or the last few classes we've been looking at in verse 2, I was in spirit, and there was a throne set in heaven, and one sat upon the throne. We looked at the fact that this is the, the political heavens. He's to look on like a jasper and a sardine stone, and there's a rainbow round about the throne, in sight like unto an emerald. And round about the throne are 24 seats, or thrones, and uh, upon the, the seats 24 elders sitting, clothed in white raiment, with crowns upon their heads. And out of the throne proceeds lightnings, thunders, and voices, and there were seven lamps of fire before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And then we get into the cherubim or seraphim in chapter 4 and verses 6 and on. So we're looking then at this section where we have Revelation chapter 4. And this is really our, our subject for tonight. And it's, it's coming in there at verse 5. We have um, 4 verse 5, the thunders. And we've got lightnings. And voices and seven lamps. Now how far we'll get through all of that, I'm not totally sure, but that's basically uh, our subject for tonight. So this is now what's going on, or proceeding forth from this throne as we get into the subject that's, that's there before us. So when you look at that, you say, okay, how does that then relate to the section we just read from Daniel chapter 7? This is the vision, it's the kingdom age, you have the Lord Jesus Christ. He's surrounded with his saints. It's the covenant throne. And we're now looking at, okay, Daniel chapter 7. It's when the Ancient of Days does come. So let's just flip back there. And we'll pick up on some of the phraseology that we read together in Daniel chapter 7. And we started off in verse 9. Okay? So just pick up the elements that are there. So we have somebody on the throne. Now he's called... The Ancient of Days. And he sits on the throne. Right? So, if you parallel that with what we've got in Revelation, chapter 4, we've got somebody sitting upon a throne. And in Daniel chapter 7, you've got somebody sitting on a throne. And we're drawing a line between those two people and saying they are one and the same person. Remember we talked about last time, the fact that he's called Ancient of Days. Don't let that throw you off. Um, it's not that he's endless of days. It's not that he's uncreate. He's that he, he does have a finite number of days, but it's just really old. And of course, the Lord Jesus Christ is the oldest man living. And so, or to ever have lived for that matter. But now notice what's going on. Um, he's got his garments white as snow and, and his, the hair of his head like pure wool. So he's got the white garments and the wool in his hair. But notice that um, what it describes his throne as. I'm going to change colors. Hopefully this one's a bit darker. There we go. So you have here his throne, okay, is likened to... A fiery flame. Okay. I don't think that's right. Lightning, right? Light. It's L I G H. Is it N I G H? With an H. Yeah. L I G H T. T. I N G. I N G. Ten. 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 Ten likened to or coming from this throne is a fiery flame. 
right? Now, there's other beasts that are going to be here that in this situation are going to have their dominion taken away. So we know the beasts are the kingdoms of men. So this is the subject matter of Daniel 7, verse 9. They have their kingdom taken away. They continue for a period of time, but they're going to have their, their dominions, right? They're going to be taken away. So you, you look at that and you say, okay, um, that's partly what's going on. However, there is another system here, um, and that is basically you've got this other situation where you have um, verse 10, we have a fiery stream. Is going to come out. And one of the players is going to be destroyed. And that comes in verse 11. The little horn is going to be destroyed. So that's kind of the narrative, or roughly the narrative of what's going on. And you can draw some parallels here with, with some of the other pieces. So kingdoms of men have kingdom taken. Kingdoms of men. Yeah, yeah. okay, thank you. Yeah, I kind of get dyslexic and mm -hmm. get carried away here. So you've got <laughs> thunders and lightnings tied in with this fiery stream that is going on. Kingdoms of, well, do men in small, because they are small anyway. <laughs> okay, so the kingdoms of men or the kingdoms of the beast, basically, are, are have their dominion taken away. Um, so, here's the situation. You have lightnings and a fiery stream. You have somebody on the throne here, and you've got somebody on the throne here. You have similar language, and the subject matter is the same. It's about taking away dominion from the world, right? And it happens at the behest of the saints, um, because that's what comes up in Daniel chapter 7 is it's the saints that are involved in this great work. So you take a look, uh, verse 12 or 11, the, the beast is slain, his body destroyed, given to the burning flame. So the little horn and the, the fourth beast is what it is. And remember what the fourth beast is? Rome, right? Fourth beast is Rome. That's going to be the subject of judgment of the Ancient of Days. But the people playing in this that are given to us here is in verse 18. Okay, the ones enacting this is verse 18, and it's called the saints. And you also have um, verse 22. You also have the saints, and they're going to take the kingdom. So this is actively seizing the kingdom of men from this group of people that are, that are basically involved in this whole situation here. So we have this active snatching away from the nations, their kingdoms, and their dominions, and from one of them specifically, which is the fourth beast, the Roman system, it's going to get its hand, head handed to it on its plate, basically. It's going to be destroyed uh, completely. And it's a judgment that is going to take place. And notice what it says there in verse 11. It's the burning flame, right? 11 and 12, it's the burning flame that's going to enact this judgment. It's called divine retribution. Yeah. We're going to be laying the smack down big time, right? So here you have the burning flame, once again, that is going to bring this about. So when you look at this... You start connecting the dots between the thematic elements of what is going on in this picture, right? You have a situation where you have judgment, the nations are being judged, they're having their dominion taken away, and it's happening by lightning or a fiery stream or a burning flame. Call it what you like, there's this great pyrotechnics display that's going to go on, and it's going to obliterate the Roman Empire. That's going to be the end result. So it's going to remove these nations, and it's going to be basically taking away their dominion. Now just jump over to Revelation. Let's just go to Revelation 
and let's go to, all the way to the end to chapter 20 because I just want you to parallel here with what's going on in verses 11 and 12. Revelation chapter 20 and verses 11 and 12. I think it's my turn. <clears throat> and I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heavens, f- heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books, according to their works. Okay, so just notice here what's being said, right? You have a situation, Revelation 20, there's somebody sitting on a throne, from whose face it says, the heaven and the earth fled. Mm -hmm. Well, the heaven and the earth that are fleeing in this case are the heavens and the earth that now are, right? So it's the, the current situation from this one, they're all scattering. So when you think of the four living creatures, or the four beasts, sorry, of Daniel chapter 7, one is obliterated, but the others, it says here there's no place found for them. They have no dominion anymore. There's nowhere for them to rest and to rule over. Now, where else have you heard this, there's no place found? It's just a, a little echo that goes back to Daniel. Do you remember when the stone smote the image? And it turned it into chaff, Ooh. Right? Blew it all over the place, and there's no place for it to land, right? There's nowhere for it to settle. There is nowhere for this kingdom to be resurrected. Now, why is that significant? Why come out and say it? Well, because if you think about it, this is what's been going on since the beginning. The lion was taken over by the bear. The bear was superseded by the leopard. The leopard was superseded by the fourth beast. Out of the fourth beast came the little horn, right? That Roman Empire, basically, um, and the papacy that goes with it. You transfer that through the book of Revelation, right? In the book of Revelation, what do we have? Well, we have the great red dragon with the ten horns, right? And then he transforms, that's the pagan Roman system, into the system of um, the Christian Roman Empire in Revelation 13, which transforms into the Holy Roman Empire in Revelation 13, the beast of the earth, which transforms into Revelation 17, the harlot who's riding the resurrected beast, right, which is Europe as we know it today. So the whole career of this system has been, you know, death and resurrection or or transmogrification, call it what you like, um, transmorphing of the the beast system through its various stages until it reaches the end. Well, at this point in time, there's no changing that's going on. There's no metamorphosizing. It's just done. It's finished, right? It's done with, that's it, kaput, ixne, you know, pining for the fjords. It's all finished, right? So at this point in time, that's why he makes the point, and it's a very clear point, it's, it's the time when the, the political heavens of the world today have nowhere to rest. And notice what it says in Revelation 20. The books are opened. What did we read back in Daniel chapter 7? There was 10,000 standing before him. And the judgment was set and the books were opened. Right? So when you start putting these things side by side, let's just write that reference down just so we've got it. So this is Revelation 20. It tells you there, the books are opened. They're unsealed, finally. And compare that with Daniel 7.10, where you also have the books opened. And those are the books of judgment, right? And so this is the situation that is taking place. You have here the judgments that are going forth. What are those judgments characterized as? Well, thunders, lightnings, voices, and lamps, right? So this is what this judgment is all about. And the books are opened. The judgment that is now going to get enacted is the lightnings, the thunders, and the voices. That's what's going on. That's the judgment. It's called the fiery stream in Daniel 7. It's called the lightning in Revelation chapter 4, right? 
So it's the same thing. It's the same picture. We're just looking at it from two different perspectives. We're looking at it from Daniel's perspective, 2,600 years before it happens, and John's perspective, 2,000 years before it happens, or 1,900 and change, right? So, so there's the two perspectives that we have, one from 606 B.C., or whatever the year would have been when Daniel saw this, and the other one from AD 97 or thereabouts. Now, it's interesting that this judgment, this, this fiery stream, this burning flame, this lightning, isn't a physical um, anomaly. It's a typical anomaly. Well, what do we mean by that? Well, take a look at Psalm 104 and verse 4. Psalm 104 and verse 4. And whoever's next, if you'd like to read that for us, and I can't remember who it would be. Psalm 104, verse 4. Yeah. Who maketh his angels spirits, his ministers a flaming fire. So this flaming fire, or is ministers, mm -hmm. his angels, his angels, his angelos, his malak, are flaming fire. What are they also called? What was the Minister, other word? His ministers. Yeah. Made what? Made the flaming fire. You got a dad? Spirits. Yes. Spirits. Okay. Okay, so there you have spirits and the flaming fire. The ministers and the angels, right? They're spirits, and they're also given to us as a flaming fire. Now hold that thought. Actually, we're going to cheat because if you hold it too long, it'll be gone and I'll never remember to bring you back there. My version says winds instead of spirit. Well... That would make sense, yeah. right? Because it's Ruach, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, just hold that thought because um, these lamps of fire in verse 4, or verse 5, sorry, we didn't put it on there, we're told that there are thunders, lightnings, voices, lamps, right? But if you come back to verse 5 in Revelation, it says, which are what? The seven spirits. Okay, so we should really add that to the end. We're back in Revelation 4, right? Revelation oh, 4 and right. verse 5. They are also spirits. Right? Those two things are linked. You've got ministers being a flaming fire, right? And they are, or angels and ministers and the spirits, basically, which ties in... Revelation chapter 4, verse 5. So what we're seeing is, it's the language is being duplicated over and over and over again. Like we're picking up all the threads, and those threads are then coming together. And now I've written on it again. I've got to snap this one more time. Just a minute. Okay. So, now... Hold that thought, right? Because what they're doing, as I've turned ahead, I knew I'd do this. Um, I just want you to pick up on this. The heaven and the earth fled away, right? That's what was going on here in Revelation 20. Oh, we're back. Okay. The political heavens and the earth fled away, right? So we're just picking up and we're kind of cascading this language on down. So let's turn to our next passage, which is in... Um, Daniel, no, sorry, Jeremiah, and it's verse, chapter 51, because we're talking about the judgments on Rome, right? So this is Jeremiah, chapter 51. Mm -hmm. If you put this into context, the system that was in place in John's day is Rome. Daniel is talking about the judgment against the fourth beast, which is Rome, Right? So these are judgments on Rome. Uh. 
So take a look then at Jeremiah, what do we say, 51 yeah. verses 25 to 26. Behold, I am against you, a destroying mountain, declares the Lord, which destroys the whole earth. I will stretch out my hand against you, and roll you down from the, the crags, and make you a, a burnt mountain. No sh stone shall be taken from you for a corner, and no stone for a foundation. But you shall be a... Desolate forever. Abomination, maybe? I sure have what you're P -R -P -E -T -U -L. Perpetual? Perpetual okay. waste, declares the Lord. Okay, so yeah, perpetual waste or a desolation. desolation. So, pick up the irony in what's being said here, okay? Because you're going to see this all the way through as we move ahead, okay? You have here a destroying mountain. Where else do you hear of a destroying mountain? The stone that was cut out of the hand. Yeah. Right? Right. Died. So Zion is also, so Daniel 2, so just contrast, contrast Daniel 2, the stone cut out without hands becomes a mountain that destroys. What does it destroy? Kingdoms of the earth. The kingdom of men. Become chaff. Go away. What does this mountain destroy? What was this mountain destroying that, that Jeremiah is reading about? Babylon. It's Babylon, Babylon. right? So it is Babylon. Which becomes Rome, Rome, right? But what is it destroying? Oh, the earth. Eretz. What is it destroying? Um, All those who worship idols. What is the destroying mountain come to destroy? What nation? Oh, Israel. Oh. Israel. Oh, Israel. Right? Yeah. yeah. Oh, so it, here's your parallel. Again, okay. Rome is called a destroying mountain. What does it destroy? Israel. But the kingdom of Israel, when it comes, is going to be a destroying mountain. What does it destroy? Rome. Right? What is this city? Babylon. What is this city? Zion. What is this group of people? The seed of the serpent. What is this group of people? The seed of the woman. Right? So you see capital cities destroying, like you have contrasts yeah. all the way through. Mm -hmm. And it's probably just worth us taking the time just to do this for a minute. Let's just draw the contrast on two sides here. So you have, if we start at, at the beginning with, with uh, seed of the seed of serpent. Okay? And then on the other side, I'm going to try for it. This one seems to be you have the seed of the woman. Okay? You have a destroying mountain. Oh, destroying mountain. So it's Babylon, destroying mountain. And on this side, you have Zion, which is the mountain of the Lord. which is also destroying. It's going to destroy Babylon, whereas Babylon is going to destroy Israel. So you begin to see this pattern that we've got going on here. So you have in this then the seed of the woman, the seed of the serpent, as that one uh, old... French Revolution book was called. Do you remember what it was called? I think it was French Revolution. I never read it. But. Tale of Two Cities. So, yeah. Right? So here's your two cities. Oh, yeah, Tale of Two Cities. Jerusalem 
And over here, you've got Rome or Babylon. What's the name of Rome? What do they call Rome? The Eternal City. Oh, the Eternal City. Yeah. What do they call Jerusalem? The Eternal City. Right? So you, you begin to see this parallel that's going on. This, this is a contest that's going on between the whole story that rolls out here. Now, notice what it's also called here. He's going to be made desolate. Well, what has he been to this point in time? He's been Troublemaker. the desolator. Yeah. If it's spelled desolator, I'd be doing great. You could spell anything if you're doing it right. Yeah. Desolator, right? Jerusalem to this point has been the desolated. Right? Trodden down of the Gentiles till the tellings of the Gentiles be fulfilled, right? Going into the Olivet Prophecy, it's called desolate, right? And yet that whole situation is going to be reversed. Zion's going to become the desolator, and Jerusalem, or sorry, um, and Babylon is going to be the desolated, right? So you have this reversal that's going down. What happens to the mountain of the Lord in the, in the last times? Isaiah tells us, mountain of Yahweh is lifted up. It's you know, lifted. I'm reading a book at the moment on uh, Israel getting the bomb. Getting the bomb. And if we just think, what would it be like if they hadn't got the bomb? <laughs> they would be trodden down something terrible. And the thing is, is that we know that they will never use the bomb. And yet, yeah. Right? Yeah. Because it would destroy the inheritance. Right? So you have a mountain that's going to be brought yeah. down, yeah. and you have a mountain that's going to be lifted up. Isaiah 2. Yeah. The mountain of the Lord's house in the latter day shall be exalted above the hills. Right? So you have this whole kind of uh, situation that's being played out, one against the other, the destroying of the one, the destroying of the other. It's, it's this, as this one, when this one's running high, this one's running low. When this one's running high, this one's running low. Like, you can't have both. It's either kingdom of God or kingdom of men. They never sit side by side. As Brother Thomas says, it's war to the knife between the true Christadelphians in the world. You can't have peace. Either they conquer us or we conquer them. It's the only way it is. How else do you get corn to grow? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. How else do you get corn to grow on the mountaintops? Fertilizing with bodies. <laughs> <laughs> Fertilizing with bodies and topically rain on it. Yeah. All right. So, do you remember what the Lord Jesus Christ says? If you have faith, what you can do? Move mountains. Let's take a look at it. Matthew 17, verse 10. Matthew 17, verse 10. <clears throat> 20, sorry, verse 20. And Jesus said unto them, Because of your unbelief, for verily I say unto you, If ye have faith as a grain of mustard seed, ye shall, be, ye shall say unto this mountain, Remove hence ye are yon, to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. So, what do you think the mountain he's talking about is? What mountain is going to be removed that was reigning over Israel at that point in time? The Roman, the Roman mountain. Empire. Right? So when he says, if you have faith, like a grain of mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, be removed and cast into the sea, and it's going to happen, yep. the mountain he's actually referring to is the Roman Empire. And what overcomes the Roman Empire? Well, it's faith. And a cross-reference is 1st of John, chapter 5, and verse 4. Which tells us that whatsoever is born of God overcomes the world. 
And this is the victory that will overcome the world, even our faith. Faith can move mountains. It can move the mountains of the world. And it's going to move the mountain of Rome. And it's going to cast it into the sea. That's what's going to happen to it. That's what is going to take place, right? So, come to a prophecy that kind of talks along these lines. It's in the 144th Psalm. And sometimes when you're reading through the Psalms, you kind of read through this stuff, and it doesn't really jump out at you until you start looking at these kind of themes as they go through. Psalm 144, and let's read verses 5 to 7. Psalm 144, verses 5 to 7. I will speak of the glorious honour of thy majesty, and of thy wondrous works. And men shall speak of the might of the terrible acts. That's not the right one, is it? Psalm 144. Psalm 145? 4. 4. Oh, I'm there again. Man is like to vanity. Is day 144 verse 5? Well, that was verse 4, but all right, verse 5. <laughs> For over the heavens, O Lord, and come down. Touch the mountains, and they shall smoke. Cast forth lightning, and scatter them. Shoot out thine arrows, and destroy them. Well, that's exciting. Yeah. Smoking. And verse 7. And verse 7, Dad? Send thine hand from above, uh, rid me, and deliver me out of great waters from the hand of strange children, whose mouth speaketh vanity, and their right hand is the right hand of horses. Okay, so notice here, in that section that Dad just read for us, that what you've got going on is God touching the mountains, and all of a sudden they're on smoke. Yep. You know, which reminds us of Sinai. Yep. But do you remember what it says about Jeremiah 51, what was going to happen to the destroying mountain? It was going to be burnt. Nothing right? Nothing left inside. Yeah. God touches the mountains and they smoke. Right? He also says, he sends out his lightning, and what does it do? It scatters them. But what's the them? It's the mountains, right? So his lightning is going to scatter the nations. Remember Revelation 4, what comes out? Thunders, lightnings, right? Voices, seven uh, lamps, which are the seven spirits of God. So this, this lightning that's coming out is going to destroy the mountains of the world that are all around us, right? And here he says, his lightning is going to scatter it because it's like arrows, right? So it's like the arrows of a mighty man, right? So you ask the question, okay, arrows, um, what is nation is likened to, to arrows and weapons and so forth? So let's go back to Psalm or Jeremiah 51 where we were, and let's read the couple of passages right before. So it's Jeremiah 51, verses 19 to 23. They didn't, they didn't read this when they were talking about the specific room last weekend that was erupting all over the place <laughs> and smoking. <laughs> well, what are all the buildings around Israel made out of? Basalt. Mm -hmm. But what's basalt? It's volcanic rock. There's, there's volcanoes all over the place there. Jeremiah 51, verse... 19 down to 23. Okay. Uh, Who's next? Jeremiah 51, verse 19. Okay. The portion of Jacob is not like them, for he is the former of all things, and Israel is the rod of his inheritance. Yahweh of hosts is his name. Thou art my battle axe, and weapons of war. For with thee will I break in pieces the nations, and with thee will I destroy kingdoms. Okay. 21. And with you I shatter 
the horse and his rider, and with you I shatter the chariot and its rider, and with you I shatter the man and woman, and with you I shatter old men and youth, and with you I shatter young men and virgin. And I will also break in pieces with thee the shepherd and his flock, and with thee will I break in pieces the husbandman and his yoke of oxen, and with thee will I break in pieces captains and rulers. And so, I, it's Israel. He talked about arrows here. He's going to send out his lightning, right? It's going to be his arrows. And here he says, well, my battle axe and my weapons of war is Israel. Yep. And I'm going to use yeah. you to destroy the captain and his host. Yeah. But notice who else he's going to use to destroy him? The shepherd and his flock. Yep. Right? So the shepherd of Rome and his flock are going to be destroyed at the hand of Israel. And just take a look at the end result, verses 63 to 64 in Jeremiah there. Did you read that, Marion, for us? Jeremiah 51, verses 63 to 64. And it shall be, when thou hast made an end of reading this book, that thou shalt bind a stone to it, and cast it into the midst of Euphrates, and thou shalt say, Thus shall Babylon sink, and shall not rise from the evil that I will bring upon her, and they shall be weary. Thus far the words of Jeremiah. Right, so the end result, Babylon sinks. Right, remember what we were talking about here? The stone smites the image and grows to become a mountain that fills the earth. The mountain of Babylon, the destroying mountain, is going to be cast into the sea like a stone, and it's going to sink. So they're both stones, right? And In where, their own right. Where do we read about the ships of Tartus bemoaning the demise of Babylon as Revelation. it sinks into the sea? Yeah. Disappears. Completely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So here we have the situation, right, of this, this great reversal of forces. So this is the story of um, the vision in Revelation... This is the vision that is taking place, and the story of um, Revelation 4 and 5, it's the judgment, the lightnings, the thunders, and the voices that are going to go out and scatter the nations and bring all this down upon them. It's the judgment of Daniel 7, right, which is going to destroy the beast and give his body to the burning flame, right? I got it. And um, this is what is taking place. So this is the, the effect, if you want, of this vision. So when we're looking at Daniel 4, or Daniel 7, sorry, in Revelation chapters 4 um, down to verse or 4 and 5, right? It's kind of the end of the story. We're looking at the end of the story because we read in there later on, we're not going to get to it tonight, but the sea is like a sea of glass. It's the result of the judgment, tranquility and peace upon the earth. Because the destroying nations, the great tumult has all been dealt with. It's all been put to rest, right? It's all finished. And it all happens at the hands of the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember back, many weeks ago, we were looking at um, the titles of the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember we looked at Zerubbabel, mm -hmm. right? Remember we were looking in Zechariah? Well, just take a look at Zechariah. Let's come back to this. Chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. Because you'll notice that this is the same theme. Zechariah 4, verses 6 to 7. It's the same story that's going on here that we're looking at in Jeremiah, that we're looking at in Revelation, that we're looking at in Daniel, is the destruction of the Roman Babylonian um, mountain, if you want to call it that, that has affronted God, that has basically stood in, its, in his place, and it's now going to be obliterated and wiped from the face of the earth, right? So, going to Zechariah, chapter 4, in verses 6 and 7. Then he answered and spake unto me, saying, This is the word of Yahweh unto Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. Who art thou, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel thou shalt become a plain, and he shall bring forth a headstone thereof with shoutings, crying, grace, grace unto it. Okay, so here you have 
this great mountain, right, that is going to become a plane in front of Zerubbabel, who's the one who we're told began to build the temple, and he is going to finish it, right? It's going to be made a plane. So you think of the words of Handel's Messiah, every valley shall be exalted, because Israel has been in the valley, and every mountain and hill shall be made low, because that's the nations. They're the mountains and the hills, and they're going to be made low, and he's going to bring forth the headstone. Well, interestingly enough, the word head is, of course, the word rosh, and stone is eben, right? Which is the same word for, for sons, is what it's built on. So you have the headstone, which, of course, makes a reference to the Lord Jesus Christ. So he's going to bring forth, so the, the mountain gets destroyed, but the headstone is going to be brought forward. So head is rosh, and stone here is eben, right? The headstone is going to be brought forward. And it's going to be cried with shouting, grace, grace, unto it. But the mountain is going to get wiped out. So Psalm 118, verses 12, 22, as a cross-reference to this, Psalm 118, verses 22 to 23. And that tells us, basically, about what we're looking at. I don't need to turn this one off, just a short one. It says, the stone, which the builders rejected, shall become the headstone of the corner. This is Yahweh's doing and marvelous in our eyes. So you see, this is a great reversal of everything that has been going on in the world, right? So this is the situation, right? So Zechariah is talking about the bringing down of the Babylonian mountain and the establishing of the kingdom of God, right? And when you look at this, come to chapter 9 if you're in Zechariah. Just flip over the page to Zechariah chapter 9. And, Ed, if you want to read for us the next passage, which is verses 13 to 14. So we were talking about the arrows. Um, we're talking about the battle axe and weapons of war. Take a look at Rev or Zechariah 9, verses 13 to 14. <coughs> for I have bent Judah as my bow. I have made Ephraim its arrow. I will stir up your sons, O Zion. Against your sons, O Greece, and weld you like a warrior's sword. Babylon. Then the Lord will appear over them, and his arrow will grow forth like lightning. The Lord God will sound the trumpet, and will march forth in the whirlwinds of the south. Okay, so here you have it. It says there, basically, he's going to go forth as lightning. His arrow is going to go forth as the lightning, right? And I spelled lightning wrong again, I'm quite sure. I think that's right, isn't Light it? Lightning. I don't want to oh, just... put an E in there, but there's no E in there. It's the way I say it, lightning, as in lightning the eyes, but mm -hmm. this is lightning as in lightning. thunder and lightning. Donder and Blitzen, right? Mm -hmm. They're the reindeer mm -hmm. version of this. So here you have um, Judah is the bow, Ephraim is the arrow. They're like a sword and they're like lightning, right? Now, do you remember where you first read about a sword that looks like lightning? Oh, in Genesis, oh, Genesis with, the, the, yeah, with the guarding of the... the um, Garden of Eden when right. they get yeah. kicked out when they get the, yep. they blocked up. And in the Hebrew, it says he placed in the Eden a flaming sword... Even the cherubim, or cherubim, sorry, even a flaming sword. Not and a flaming sword, it's even. They are one and the same. They are the flaming sword. They are the glistening arrow. They are the one that's going to go out and it's going to destroy the nations. And they're going to go, notice it here, with whirlwinds of the south. So involved in all of this is whirlwinds, which, of course, is cherubic. Because the cherubim in Ezekiel come out of the whirlwind, right? What went in front of Israel as they went through the wilderness, encamped as the cherubim with all the standards around them? A pillar of cloud and a pillar of fire, right? right? Who is Zion against in the situation? Who is the enemy? Greece. Greece. Who was the 
enemy, basically, um, or it's part of that whole image empire, right? Yeah. It's part of the whole image empire, Greece, the Greco-Roman Empire, right? So this is the other side of the equation are the Greeks, right? This is the situation. So now take a look. Remember our context is, is, um, is the, the, the one sitting on the throne, right? In Daniel and in Revelation, and he's going to destroy and send packing all the nations of the world, okay? Now, come to Psalm 2, verses 5 to 9. We've read this many times together, um, but now put it in this context. Psalm 2, verses 5 to 9. Whoever's next, if you want to read that for us. Psalm 2, verses 5 down to verse 9. So remember, context, king sitting on throne, or the Holy One, or however you want to describe him, right? The covenanted throne to David. Psalm 2, verse 5 to 9. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath, and vex them in his sore displeasure. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree Yahweh hath said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron, thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Okay, so notice the, the story that's going on here. You have a king who's been sat upon Mount Zion. Well, what is he sitting on on Mount Zion? What he's been set upon Mount Zion, right? It's the throne of David, right? That's what's on Mount Zion. That's what resides on Mount Zion is David's throne, right? So I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion. This is his son. I will declare the decree. The day, to get, today have I begotten thee, right? And he says, I'm gonna, you're going to have the nations for your inheritance, which goes right the way back to the promises to Abraham, you will possess the gates of your enemies, right? You're going to break the nations with a rod of iron. So the question is, well, then who is this rod? Or what is this rod, right? What is the rod that he's going to use to break the nations? And it's a rod of iron. Come to Micah chapter 4 and verse 13. Micah chapter 4 and verse 13, okay? So the question was... Who or what is this rod of iron that the king sitting on the throne is going to use to smite the nations? Take a look at Micah chapter 4 and verse 13. All right. Oh, who stirs it? It's shaken. Is it? Oh, okay. I've already made it a couple of times. Yeah, Micah chapter 4, verse 13. <coughs> Arise and thresh, O daughter of Zion, for I will make thine horn iron, and I will make thine hoofs brass, and thou shalt beat to pieces many people, and I will concentrate their gene unto the Lord, and their substance unto the Lord of the whole earth. All right, so there you have it. Okay. The horn is going to be iron, okay? The hoofs are going to be brass, and he's going to beat many pieces. So here you have the rod of iron, and here you have the horn of iron. So it tells you that what the Lord is going to use to destroy the nations and to beat them into many pieces is the very thing that the nations have been treading underfoot all these years. How does he put it? Arise and thresh, right, O daughter of Zion. What's the analogy he's using? I'm going to make your horns iron and your hoofs brass. What do horns and hoofs belong to? Horses. Not horses. They don't have horns. Oxen or something? Oxen. 
Oxen. When would you use oxen in a, in a case like this? When you're threshing out the grain. When you're threshing, right? Mm -hmm. He says you're going to beat in pieces many people. So Israel is going to be a tool used by God can to continue the work of Armageddon. The sheaves have been gathered into the floor, and he's going to use them to thresh those nations. And that's why we say Armageddon isn't a pitched battle that takes place over a 12-hour period. It is a war. Habakkuk tells us, arise and thresh, march through the land, like it's something that goes on through the whole land, and then it's carried off into Europe, where the harvest continues, and it's called the grape harvest, right? But the, the, the ox of uh, Israel is going to be used to do this, and it's just the irony of the scripture, because it's iron and brass that they're going to use to crush the iron and brass of the image. That's right? Neat. Isn't that neat? It's a total reversal. Mm -hmm. It's one mountain smiting another mountain. Yeah. Yeah. The trodden down become the treaders down, right? Because they've been trodden down for 2,000 years. Well, they're now going to go and they're going to tread down the nations. Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. And then when they are fulfilled, Malachi, or Micah 4 verse 13 tells us that Israel, Zion... The children of Jerusalem are going to go now tread the Gentiles down. And they're going to beat them peace, beat them to pieces. So I just want to read you a little section from Eureka Volume 2, because Brother Thomas quite puts it eloquently. We've been looking at the section tonight, um, which if you're just looking yep. for, the Logos edition, if you want to catch up, is Eureka Volume 2, Section 3, page 45, is where we kind of started tonight. Um, and in that section, he says this, that this war will have been kindled by the Messiah after his return, that he will be seen as the head of the armies of Israel, as their commander, surrounded by the sons of Zion, whom he will have raised up. He and they will be the captains of Israel, of whom Judah will be the bow, and Ephraim, or the ten tribes, his arrows. When his military organization is put into operation and it goes forth in conquest in the war of the great day of God of, or of the deity, Revelation 16, 14, reference to Armageddon, it will also issue forth as a fiery stream from the throne, reference to Daniel chapter 7, the Ancient of Days, burning with the fire of the king's indignation. As lightnings flashing from David's throne um, and echoing their thunders and voices, from one end of the earth to the other, until the controversy of Zion shall be settled beyond all cavil or dispute. Right. So that's the situation that he gives, is that this is the Lord Jesus Christ, who is marching at the head of a company, with all the saints there with him, as they're gathered together, and they're going out, and they are bringing the world into subjection. Now, before we leave the Old Testament, just one other passage, Zechariah chapter 12, this is just in this, this phrase of, of lightnings and thunders and tying it in with um, the idea of Armageddon and the sheaths, right? So Zechariah chapter 12 and verse 6, if the next person could read that for us. In that day will I make the governors of Judah like a hearth of fire among the wood, and like a torch of fire in a sheath. And they shall devour all the people round about, on the right hand and on the left. And Jerusalem shall be inhabited again in their own place, even in Jerusalem. So if you look at it there, he's going to be like a torch of fire in a sheaf. Now, if you think about that, you know, if you've ever done any farming or, or had the hay or whatever... It's all dried out. The grass has been cut. Mm. It's been gathered. It's been dried. And you go put a torch of fire into it <laughs> and whoomp. Yeah. Up she yeah. goes. Yeah. But what else is really interesting is it's gone in no time. And when it's gone, there's Clean. nothing left. Yeah. That's what right? happened yeah. to my farm. That's what the, happened to your farm? The, the rye had a chunk of, a little chunk of granite go through it. And the granite sparked. And the guy in the combine saw, when he came around again, that there was a black spot there. By the time he got out of the combine, he had to get back in it and get it out of the field. But yeah. all the stuff that was strawed in rows was just going. Gone. 
just went. Yeah. That's but the great. stuff that they hadn't combined yet would yeah. go. My cedars are along the roadside like Roman candles. Wow. Yeah. Everything gone. Everything gone. Yeah. But wow. the farmer had insurance and he replaced all my cedars. Well, there that you go. That was before the cedars you got in Alvin. The, the cedars I got now, there's only about four them. or five of them that are left. So oh, the okay. Ones. Yeah. So that's the picture that's given to us. Yeah. Like a torch in a sheet. Oh. It's like, unbelievable. That is like, you know, <coughs> it's we're probably one of the best imageries that you can get. Mm -hmm. Is that this whole thing just goes up like whoom and it's gone. That's what man's great armies coming down on the mountains of Israel. Big gone in an instant. deal. Yeah. Right? Yeah. God intervenes and they are absolutely and completely obliterated. That's gonna be some fire. Oh yeah going to burn for a long time where the fire is not put out right it's going to go and go and go so just come over now because we're picking up on all the language that's been going on here to revelation 19 because this is a parallel passage to a lot of the ones we've been looking at here the bad laughs the weapons of war the goodly horse in battle we have looked at this before but just to plug it back into its context revelation chapter 19 and we have here um the picture of the Lord Jesus Christ going forth in with his army. So it's Revelation 19, and we're going to read verse 11 to 16 to start with. 11 to 16. And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed, clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Keep going. Yeah, stop there for right now. So, but just notice here that he's going to, you've got the sharp sword, you've got the rod of iron, Right? And just connect the dots here, right? You, you've got the, the different pieces that we've been looking at. Um, we had him talking about, we, didn't, we don't have it on here, I think it was on the other one. Um, thou art my, uh, where is he here? Battle axe and weapons of war is, is the one we've already looked at. Okay, so thou art my battle axe and weapons of war, right? And notice here, he's the captain on a horse, surrounded by armies on horses. So he's the commander of the commanders we talked about last week. He's got the sharp sword, and he's got, notice, this rod of iron, which figured basically back in Micah and also in Psalm 2, right? This rod of iron that he's going to go out and he's going to smite the nations with. And Jeremiah tells us, you are my goodly horse in battle, with thee I'm going to smite the nations. Well, here we see the Lord Jesus Christ riding that very horse, right? He's riding the goodly horse in battle that we read of in Jeremiah, and he's going out into this great conflagration to basically put the torch to the sheaf and obliterate the nations, right? He's going to absolutely blow them away, right? They're going to be like tinder, just up they go. I like your phrase, Roman candles, because that's basically what they are, oh, yeah. right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, oh, yeah. So, <laughs> off they go. Kaboom, right? Wow. Now, wow. keep reading now. Maybe, Tim, if you want to pick it up. Verse 17 down to verse 21, right? Because, remember, in Daniel, we were talking about what got destroyed, right? What was destroyed was the little horn that spoke great things, that wore out the saints of the Most High, and the fourth beast. So what do we find in Revelation? So let's pick it up, verse 17 in chapter 19, uh, verse 17 down to the end of the chapter. And I saw an angel standing in the sun. He cried with a loud voice, saying, To all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God. That you may eat the flesh of kings, and the flesh of captains, and the flesh of mighty men, and the flesh of horses, and of them that sit on them. 
and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had, the, had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone, and the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceeded out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. <coughs> wow. yeah. So here you have wow. the beast and the false prophet, right? Yeah. You got Europe that's being ridden by the Catholic system, and it's going to be cast into a lake of fire, right? Now, when you think about that, that's exactly what we've been talking about. The great mountain that's going to become a plain, right? Remember what Jeremiah did with that scroll? He took a rock, tied it to the scroll, and says, so shall Babylon sink, and he throws it out. Down it goes, plop, and to the bottom of the great river Euphrates, right? So here you have the Lord Jesus Christ and the saints going out to battle, Thou art my battle axe and weapons of war. With thee I'm going to smite what? The chariot and his rider, the horse and his rider. There you have them. The chariot, the, the captains, the, those that sit on horses, the mighty men and all those people. And he says, you're also going to smite the shepherd and his flock. He says, you're going to destroy the false prophet and those that, 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 that wrought miracles and the beast, right? All these things are going to be destroyed, right? From the sword of him that sits upon the, the, the horse which sword proceeds out of his mouth? Because the sword is the word of God. The word of God is quick, it's alive, and it's powerful, and it's sharper than any two-edged sword. It divides asunder to the soul and the spirit, right? It knows exactly. It's a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. And the Lord is going to see through this multitude that's gathered together. And he's going to discern the thoughts and the intents of their heart. And their intent is to destroy him yep. Yep. and to destroy basically Israel. Yeah, oh yeah. And he yeah. says, not going to happen. They can't destroy the king of kings or the Lord of lords. It obliterates the lot of them. Right? So there you have it, basically. The whole thing is completely and absolutely destroyed. And she is completely and absolutely obliterated. Now just look back over the page. Revelation 18, verse 21. This is the judgment of the harlot system, right? Babylon the Great. A mighty angel took a stone like a great millstone and cast it into the sea, saying, Thus with violence the great city Babylon shall be thrown down and shall be found no more at all. Right? Why? While well, verse 24, in her was found the blood of prophets and saints and of all them that were slain upon the earth, right? This system is guilty and deserves it. As he yeah. says elsewhere, true and righteous are thy judgments, Lord God Almighty. This isn't a barbaric or a nasty or a vindictive or a vengeful judgment. It's a true and righteous mm -hmm. judgment to obliterate a system that has been persecuting the Jews and the saints, the people of God, for two millennia. And the whole thing is going to get completely and absolutely annihilated. It's going to be cast into the sea because it is guilty. Because it is worthy. Right? And so the system is going to be completely smacked down. So that's the picture that we have in Revelation chapter 4 and 5 when we have these thunders. We've really not looked at the thunders so much as we have the lightnings that have gone forth. We'll look at the thunders, God willing, in our next class. And we'll talk a little bit about the seven lamps, and maybe we'll get into the actual the, the aspect of the cherubim. Um, but this is the great vision. So when you when you go back, let's just go back to Revelation four. We, we've spent a lot of time kind of building this whole case, but now let's just plug ourselves back into that vision, and, and kind of see. We're in Brother Roger Lewis calls it the throne room vision of the deity. Right? We've been taken to the throne room, really, of the Lord Jesus Christ at this point in time. Um, who is God manifest in the flesh, who is sitting on his holy hill of Zion where God has put him, and against whom the nations have come together. So we have in verse 2, John is taken, he's invited to come up hither, we talked about that, 
how that basically it's a change in nature. So he's found there in verse 2 immediately. He's in spirit. He's in spirit nature now. And he sees the throne set in heaven and the one who sits on the throne. So this is the throne room of the Lord Jesus Christ in the political heavens that are being established upon the earth. The one sitting upon the throne is the Lord Jesus Christ, right? The multitudinous Lord Jesus Christ, that is. He that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone. One represents God manifested and the other represents the flesh, right? God manifest in the flesh, the sardine being the red and the jasper being the, the greenish blue look, right? And I owe you that tape. Yes, there, I'm Marianne. just trying yes. to write that. God manifest um, in the flesh is the sardine. Is, is jasper. Okay. And the flesh is the sardine stone. Okay, thank you. Round about the throne, there is this rainbow. And it's in the sight like to an emerald. And we talked about the fact that in order to have a rainbow, you first of all have to have a storm. You have to have the sun. You need to have the clouds. And you need to have the rain. All those elements need together. So the rainbow, the covenant, only comes into effect following the storm. That's when the first one came. A bow was put into the clouds by uh, God when it came to the time of, of Noah's flood, right? It's like an emerald round about the throne. And there are 24 seats, and upon the seats, 24 elders sitting, clothed with white raiment, and they have crowns on their heads, and we read later on that they have harps, right? So we talked about the fact that these 24 elders are symbolic of the saints, the saints in their king-priest function, because they're sitting on thrones, but they're clothed in white raiment, and they're wearing white robes, which is the ephod, right, basically the idea, and they're carrying harps. And we likened it to the 24, the courses of the Levites that uh, officiated under David, the sons of Zadok, of course, um, Ithamar, and, and so on and so forth. And they're also the singers, because they're there with their harps, and they're singing the song of Moses and the Lamb. And there they are all gathered there, and they have on their heads crowns of gold, which are the crowns of righteousness that they've been given. And remember, this is not an inherited priesthood, it's one that has been given to them. Thou hast made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign upon the earth. And so, from this throne then, proceed these lightnings and thunders and voices, and the seven lamps of fire burning before the throne of God, which are the seven spirits of God. We haven't quite finished verse 5, but you've got the picture here of judgment now that has been prepared and is going to go out onto the nations. And that's really the story of what goes on now. It's judgment of the nations, but it actually begins way back in John's time. Because judgment of the nations has been going on all the way through. So we're going to see, and we'll, we'll cruise pretty quickly, I think, through the rest of chapter 4 and into chapter 5, hopefully. Um, because you now have all the symbols interpreted, just about. We've got the Lamb to look at, which we have looked at before. But you have the one who sits upon the throne, and you have one like the Son of Man who comes, and he takes the scroll. And the Lamb is found worthy to open the scroll, and they open the scroll, and it bursts into what? the judgments of Almighty God on the nations, which have been going on since the time of John, right the way through till now, in your seals, followed by your trumpets, followed by your vials, and getting into, at the end, the thunders. So this is like we've been transported right the way through the kingdom age to basically be shown what God has done throughout all the ages and to see that there is an order to all of this and this is his hand that's been at work in every single age where the saints struggled under the oppression of either the Romans yeah. or their successor, the Christian Roman Empire, or the Holy Roman Empire, or the world that is around us today. So this is culminating then in what we see here, which is where the Lord Jesus Christ then is enthroned, and he brings about those judgments that end the kingdom of man at the end, mm -hmm. and they establish the kingdom of God, and the Lord basically sits upon his throne. And the beautiful thing is, Revelation chapter 3 and verse 21. To him that overcomes, I'm going to grant, I'm not going to earn it, I'm going to grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am sat down with my father in his throne. What else did we read in those books? The, the, the letters to the Ecclesiastes? He's going to rule the nations with a rod of iron. They're going to walk with me in white because they're worthy. So all those things we looked at in the letters to the Ecclesias, 
now show up in the visions of the apocalypse in the throne room because the people that are involved in this vision are the ones who came out of the great tribulation. You know, what are these that are arrayed in white robes? Whence came they? These are they that came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. And the beauty is, it's the Lord's doing. And it's marvelous in our eyes. Because if you or I had to do it, we couldn't. If you or I had to overcome by ourselves, we could not do it. But God is able to do it. He's able to complete in us the work that he has begun. And that's where our hope rests. This is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. We believe that God can complete in us the work that he has begun in his son and in every single one of us in calling us to his throne, in calling us to the truth, in calling us to obedience. So that's the picture we have in Revelation. So as we go through the rest of the book, we're going to see there's, there's several of these snapshot visions, right? There's several of these snapshot visions given really to each age where we're going to travel through and we're going to see you know, the different seals and vials and their encouragement visions for the people living at the time to say that God is going to bring you to the end of the vision, to the time when that great cry goes out, it is done. It's finished and it's complete. And we're living on the knife edge of that at the very, very brink of the kingdom, when everything that we have to deal with in this life is like that sheaf, right? You take that torch, you put it to that sheaf, and it's gone. All that's left is what matters. So that's why we've got to put our effort into the what matters part, and the rest of it is just manna for a day. It's just for the moment. So exciting stuff as as we peel into the book of Revelation. Um, We'll try and get to uh, the Carabic visions. As I've said, we're not going to spend a ton of time on them. There are, I think, six classes online. If you want to go through and and take a look at those or review them, by all means, go ahead. They're on the Christadelphian resource site, so I can email that out. I'll send that out to everybody, the six classes. And you can't mention the the classes on there one. Yes. Yeah, for a couple of weeks, we couldn't load anything up to the site because I had too much on there. Um, so I have to do some house cleaning, but the, the person who looks after it for me has been gracious enough to give me a little bit more room. Um, so we're, our class for this last two weeks is now up online, and um, it's, uh, you can go back and review that if you've missed it. So um, that's more or less where we're at, and um, we're, uh, we're kind of plowing along. It seems fairly slow. But the reality is this lays the foundation on which everything stands. When we come in to deal with beasts and whatever, it's, it's not such a big deal because we've already looked at how to, we've been given the keys on how to interpret it and we can, we can roll through and look at them pretty quickly. Uh, just one other thing, by the way, when we were doing our chart, right? I meant to write this down on there. You had four beasts in Daniel 7, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. There was the, the lion, there was the, the bear, there was the leopard, and there was the dragon. Guess how many cherubim there are? Four. four living creatures, wow. right? So the parallel just keeps on going. Wow. Four beasts, unclean creatures, four living creatures that, are, that come up in the book of Revelation and in Ezekiel. So constantly you have this parallel between the two that runs all the way through the book of Revelation. So um, I think we'll end there.